Baldur's Gate 3 has been out for a little while now and I, along with a lot of other people, have been enjoying it quite a lot. We've published a bunch of tips and tricks videos too, covering everything from combat and quests to multiclassing and making the most of your characters. But here's the thing. Baldur's Gate 3 is so faithful to the Dungeons & Dragons 5e rule set on which it's based that if you're coming into the series completely new, having never played a Baldur's Gate game before or even a D&D game before, you might struggle, even with tips. Just like a while back when I published an Elden Ring for Dummies series for people who had never played a From Software game before and needed to really start at the very beginning, now as an actual professional dungeon master, I'm doing the same for Baldur's Gate 3, explaining in the very simplest terms the most basic mechanics of the game for people who feel a little lost but still really want to give this incredible experience a fair shot. There's absolutely no shame in feeling lost either, by the way. A lot of even the really basic systems here might seem obvious to a D&D player, but not so much if you don't have that assumed knowledge. So let's strip it right back to the very beginning for anyone who might be struggling still. This is Baldur's Gate 3 for dummies. That is, anyone who just needs a little bit of a helping hand from someone in the know explaining the things that Larian might not have. To explain how Baldur's Gate 3 works, let me first explain a little bit about how Dungeons & Dragons 5e, that is the current standard rule set, also works. At its heart, Dungeons & Dragons is collaborative storytelling between a group of players where the outcome of key actions and moments are dictated by the roll of a dice. One person in a game takes on the role of the Dungeon Master, or DM, someone who acts as lead storyteller and a sort of referee. The DM fills the role of everyone else the player characters may encounter on an adventure, while describing the world and events as they unfold around the party. In a typical D&D session, the DM may set puzzles or traps for the group to work together to solve. They might engage them in combat against other humanoids or monsters, or they might simply allow them to explore the world as they see fit, improvising as the players roleplay their characters' interactions with the fantasy world around them. The success of all of their interactions is dictated by players' individual ability scores, skills, and attributes, recorded on their character sheet. These stats vary depending on a player's class, level, and race, as well as any proficiencies they possess and any boosts granted through special weapons, spells, or potions. All players have six basic stats. You've got strength, intelligence, dexterity, wisdom, constitution, and charisma. From these, different skills derived from those six stats are also listed on the character sheet. Intimidation and persuasion branch out from charisma, for example, and history and investigation from intelligence. Now, all of these stats and skills have a numerical value attached to them that signifies a player's aptitude in that stat. And different classes are more naturally inclined towards certain stats than others, because these stats literally drive their key abilities. When the DM presents a party with a problem, let's say a door is locked, for instance, players must use their creativity in tandem with their special skills to overcome it. So where a melee fighter could try and smash the door down because they are naturally stronger, a rogue might use their superior dexterity to try and pick the lock. But then, depending on other factors and special items, players could always try to find a different way entirely. A bard or another high charisma class could try and charm someone into unlocking the door for them. Or a druid might shapeshift into a spider and try to crawl under the frame. In any case, once the player knows what it is they want to attempt, the DM will have them roll an ability check with a 20-sided dice, or a d20. Every action they attempt will have a number signifying its difficulty attributed to it based on general rules and the DM's own discretion. The larger the number, the more difficult the action. If the player rolls higher than that number, they are successful in performing their action. But even if they roll lower, they can still beat the check by adding their specific modifiers. A melee fighter who chooses to roll a strength check will be able to add their naturally higher strength modifier to the number rolled with the dice, making a successful roll more likely. Other sided dice are used in D&D, most often to see what damage is dealt with an attack or spell. Sometimes the DM will also have players roll dice to avoid certain outcomes, like diving out of the way of a sudden trap. These are known as saving throws. I'm not quite sure why you stood up for us like that. But I won't say I'm not grateful. 
strange little beast. I would have made short work of it. Anyway, once. all that to say, Baldur's Gate 3 plays pretty much exactly the same as an actual game of D&D, even when you don't see the dice being rolled. For example, in combat. Skill checks outside of combat you see and are thus easier to understand, but this is the underlying system that dictates everything in the game, from when you take your turn in combat to whether you notice traps or treasure while exploring the world. It's thus important to think about not only your character, but who they take with them while on their adventure and who you get to perform certain actions. For example, unless you've created a new character from scratch and are playing as a rogue, you should always select and control a Starion when attempting anything like lockpicking or disabling traps, because dexterity is his primary ability and thus he is far more likely to succeed at dex-based skill checks than you are. It's important to know what skills fuel what checks and selecting characters accordingly based on their stats and individual strengths. In a tabletop game of D&D, inspiration is usually given in the form of some sort of token or coin, awarded at a DM's discretion. Traditionally for when a player does something that's in keeping with the personality traits of their character, but often just when a player does something particularly clever or funny. In Baldur's Gate 3, it is indeed granted when you, the player, choose an action that is thematically in keeping for characters in your party. When Lazel is allowed to be particularly bloodthirsty in battle, for example, or when Astarian is at his best deceptive, hedonistic self. The function of rewarded inspiration is basically the same in both tabletop D&D and BG3. At any time, you can use your inspiration token as advantage to reroll any ability check of your choice. This is obviously a very useful thing to have in your back pocket for checks that you really, really want to succeed on. So we'd recommend always having at least one inspiration roll saved for those big moments that could change the course of your story. So the thing that can really throw a lot of new players when it comes to Baldur's Gate 3 is of course, the combat. When can you move? What can you do? How do spell slots work? How do I get better at winning? Well, let's answer that last one first. The truth is, to improve your chances at winning in a combat encounter in Baldur's Gate 3, you need to start planning for a win before the battle has even begun. The type of terrain that you're on, where you are in relation to your party members and your enemies, whether you're out in the open or behind cover, or who actually initiates the fight, all of these things can make a huge difference to your chances. But let's say you're in an area where you know hostile monsters or animals or bandits are patrolling. You should be looking to move through higher ground wherever possible, staying stealthed if possible to give you the best chance at not being ambushed, maybe even getting someone like Shadowheart to cast past without a trace on the party if you have it, as this grants a whopping plus 10 to everyone's stealth checks. Pressing C when you're trying to stay undetected is a must. Not only can you see better where characters will go and what route they'll take, you can also see an enemy's cone of vision and avoid accordingly. The reason this is all worth trying is making an attack on an unaware enemy grants them the surprise status, and enemies that are surprised cannot move, take actions, or make reactions during the first round of combat. In Baldur's Gate 3's turn-based combat, this means you'll be much better placed to position your party, deal some initial damage, and generally set yourself up for success right off the bat. But what if you're suddenly flung into a combat situation you weren't prepared for? Well, there's not tons you can do about that once the battle has begun, but if you're in, say, a conversation with an NPC and you feel like a fight is brewing, you can still set some of your characters up for combat by switching to them mid-conversation and moving them to a more opportune location. Position your casters a bit further back or on higher ground, for example. Small tweaks like that can be all it takes to gain an immediate upper hand, and it's smart to take every opportunity that you have to put yourself in as best a position as you can. Understand that this is a slow-paced game. There is no need to hurl yourself headlong into encounters without first taking the time to prepare and position yourself for initiative before every battle that you can. The weak true soul. Most curious. You heed an overgrown toadstool, yet defy a true soul. Thryn, carve out her heart. Harpers! To arms! Let's talk about combat proper and what you can do in a round, because it really can be confusing if you don't know what's what. 
In Dungeons & Dragons, when a fight begins, everyone, player characters, enemies, and NPCs, roll initiative. And the number everyone rolls, from highest to lowest, dictates the order in which they're allowed to make their plays. Cycling through every participant in combat is called a round, and every round of combat lasts for approximately 6 seconds of in-game real-time. In that 6 seconds, a character can move, take an action, and take a bonus action. You can also use reactions, but we'll get to those shortly. Generally speaking, a medium character's base movement is 30 feet, and it's easily shown in BG3 by a white line on the ground and also the blue meter on the right of your action bar. The line on the ground is also useful as it shows whether your character will walk through anything that will impede their movement. Difficult terrain, for example, will half how far they can move. If you need to move further, say if you need to reach a lever or a portal in a set number of rounds, you can use dash as an action. Rogues like Astarian can use dash as a bonus action. Shit. Make every strike count. But what's the difference between an action and a bonus action, I hear you say? Actions are essentially the main thing you want to do on your turn. It's your primary resource in combat. Make a main weapon attack, cast a spell, throw something, hide, disengage from an enemy trying to attack you, Narratively speaking, it's the thing that you want to do that, in theory, would take the most time and energy to accomplish. The handy thing is, in Baldur's Gate 3, all your actions are grouped together in the hotbar under the tab with the green circle, while bonus actions are under the orange triangle. But if you're ever unsure of whether a spell or ability is an action, reaction, or bonus action, you can also find out by hovering over it and reading the description. Jumping, drinking a potion, and shoving are all bonus actions, for example while helping a downed companion or using a scroll counts as an action because those things would typically take longer to do. So, what you want to do when it comes to a character's turn is identify what the most useful thing they could do in that moment is, and remember that very often, that won't be dealing damage. It could be slowing down an enemy, it could be buffing a companion, or it could be getting them set up someplace safe to cast a bigger area of effect spell with another character when their turn comes around. For melee characters, they can be useful just by getting close to long-range enemies. A melee character being right beside a long-range combatant, be that a ranger or a caster, puts them in a threatened state, which means they have disadvantage on ranged attack rolls. They are less likely to hit their target. Be aware of spells and skills that can get you out of trouble fast, like Misty Step, which allows characters to teleport and get out of danger without initiating an attack of opportunity. That's another reason positioning is so important, mind you. If a character on their turn decides to move away from an enemy that's within melee range, they will provoke what's called an attack of opportunity. You can see whether an opportunity attack will be initiated or not by going into the movement menu, and a red blade appears on the ground next to you if an enemy will try to hit you if you move. Attacks of opportunity go both ways. You'll get to attack enemies if they move away from you too. But be aware that attacks of opportunity don't happen if movement is compelled. That is, if a creature is forced to move against their will. Anyway, spells like Misty Step allow you to move away from enemies without risking an attack and without expending an action by disengaging. And items like Amulet or Scroll of Misty Step allow you to do this without using a spell slot. So they're definitely worth keeping an eye out for. Now, reactions are things that you can do but only in response to something an enemy has done first, like an attack of opportunity. You generally don't have to think about these too much once you accumulate more reactions as your characters level up. The game will prompt when they've been triggered and ask if you want to do them. But do be aware, reactions are not always free. Things like shield bash and sneak attack are, and that's great, but some reactions, like counter spell, will use up one of your spell slots, so do be careful that that doesn't leave you short on slots for other things that you want to achieve. If you're ever unsure of what reactions your characters have access to, they appear at the top right corner of your hotbar. Spell slots are what a spellcaster draws upon to cast magic, and for the purposes of this video I will be using a sorcerer as an example. Different spells require different level spell slots, and you only get a finite number of these before they are replenished on a long rest. Short rests only give characters back a portion of their hit points, and long rests are essential for spellcasters, not including warlocks, to regain all of their utility by refreshing those spell slots. Now, here you can see on my hotbar I have 4 level 1 spell slots, 3 level 2 spell slots, 
three level three spell slots, three level four spell slots, and just one level five spell slot. Now what this means is I can cast a total of four level one spells, three level two spells, three level three spells, three level four spells, and one level five spell before I am completely tapped out and need to have a long rest. Some spells noted with a plus in the top right corner of their button can be cast at different levels, increasing their potency with each level. Now, sorcerers can actually replenish spell slots by using sorcery points, but that's maybe an explanation for another video. One major thing you need to know right now is that all spell casters will have access to something called a cantrip, which are essentially spells that you can cast again and again at will with no cost or drain to your resources. Because of this, cantrips are usually less powerful than a full fat spell, but they are very handy things to have in your back pocket if you're out of slots. Oh, cantrips do count as an action too, by the way. Now this video is already rather long and I feel like I have barely scratched the surface in terms of explainers, but here are a few more quick ones to help you get started. When exploring, your character will not jump automatically. If there is no straight path to your intended destination, you will need to navigate your party there and that includes getting them to jump any gaps in their way. Some party members are better at jumping than others, but some players online have found very ingenious ways around obstacles, including disguising and throwing smaller party members across large gaps. Hey, if it works, it works. Also, bear in mind that you can negate fall damage of jumping larger gaps by casting Featherfall on your party. You can get scrolls to help with this if no one has the spell learned. Rests as we already touched on, there is a difference between long and short rests. Short rests can be taken wherever you currently are and restore 50% of all characters' hit points. They also restore Warlock spell slots and they restore things like a Cleric's Channel Divinity resource and a Fighter's Superiority die. You can take two before you need to take a long rest to replenish those two slots. From level two, Bards also have something called Song of Rest, which is kind of like an extra short rest on top of the two you already have available. Then, there's long rests. You need to make camp for these, but you can also just go to your camp without taking a long rest. To do a long rest, you need to choose to end the day and use up some camp supplies. You need a total of 40 of these to fully replenish all of your character's spell slots, abilities, short rest slots, and hit points. You can do a partial long rest, but really, unless you just aren't bothering to pick up supplies or you're resting after every single combat encounter, you should never be too low for a full rest. You should also definitely take advantage of long rests at camp to spend time with your companions and get to know them better. You can get to know them really well if you wish. Don't be afraid to take long rests either as sometimes this is the only way to advance companion storylines. You should also know that wherever you choose to go to camp, that is where you'll return to once you leave camp. So don't worry about finding your way back to a random location to continue your exploring or make your way through an entire dungeon all over we again. We have to, do we? I just worry that we're not considering all our options when it comes to our uninvited guests. Finally, death saves. So a character being downed in battle isn't immediately cause for too much concern. When a character gets to zero hit points, they begin to roll what are called death saving throws three successful saves and that character is stabilized. They aren't able to fight or anything, they just aren't dead. Three fails and yes, they are indeed dead and you'll need to cast Revivify, that's so hard to say, Revivify, to bring them back. The thing is, you can heal them at any time while they're rolling these death saves to immediately bring them back to life, so try not to panic too much. The tricky part is, of course, that the ability to heal is a very finite resource in Baldur's Gate 3, as it is in Dungeons and Dragons. But maybe that's an explainer for another time. Because yeah, okay, it is becoming very clear to me that we are going to need a second video on breaking down everything a beginner needs to know about Baldur's Gate 3. So what would you like to know and what would you like us to explain if we did do another one of these? What are the best classes and spells for a beginner? Is there a good beginner's class? Maybe a glossary of key terms. Maybe what do weapon and armor proficiencies mean? Let me know in the comments what we should talk about and we will get into it next time. For now, thanks for watching and do let me know if you're enjoying the game and of course who you're romancing. I want to hear all of the gossip. I'll see you next time. Bye! Now perhaps we might try a more intimate style.